Uh, so, Michelle, I've got a hair problem. <laughs> uh, and look, frankly, if I'd known that um, I was going to be videoed, I, I would have combed my hair, but... <laughs> there we go. Um, the other thing is, just a housekeeping, uh, for the evaluation, when you get to my bit, just leave that, because I'd normally fill that in for everybody. <laughs> Fantastic audience. Uh, it's unbelievable. I'd, normally, when I come to these sorts of things, there's four people, no one's interested in what I've got to say, but this is an in incredible uh, group of um, carers, patients. I can see some of my, my patients in the rooms. They're probably 15, 16, 17 years since their diagnosis. No, they're not. There are patients here who are on treatment at the moment. Some patients are going to do well, some patients are not going to do well. Uh, this is a tough disease. Uh, I'm going to take you through a little bit about where we're up to in terms of treating brain cancer, where we're going, and then Hui Gan from um, the Austin is going to talk a little bit about the treatments that are sort of coming from far away, but will be here within the next year or two. So that's what I'm going to talk about, and Hui will talk about uh, molecular targeting trials and immunotherapy. It was a forgotten part of medicine. I don't think I ever saw a uh, brain cancer patient when I was a student. I don't think I ever saw a brain cancer patient when I was a medical oncology trainee. That's three years, a cancer trainee. I never saw anybody. Uh, it's 1% of all cancers, that's all. So it's very uncommon. It's a really tough disease. And I reckon the two things that we are all very conscious of, <clears throat> cortisone, dexamethasone, what a bastard of a drug. You know, I wish there was something different. Uh, it's a fantastic drug up here. It's terrible for down here and that. And I'm just, it just, you know, breaks my heart when I see the 30 year old woman who was uh, 55 kilos, who's now 95 kilos. Uh, it's a terrible thing. And the other thing is, <clears throat> sorry, is personality change. Thanks. So I get the CEO to uh, get me a glass of water. Um, thanks. You know, to, to see, people's personalities change. I think it's a really tough part, the character or their memory, whatever it is. They're the two things that upset me when I look after patients for a prolonged period of time. It's a major cause of life loss. So we actually try and promote brain cancer by saying, you know what, it, it really is a bad cancer. And even though it's only 1%, it makes a real dent, dent into our community, not just for years of life lost, but you know, the carers and all the effort that's required to look after these patients. And look, fair enough, poor survival and you know, poor function. So <clears throat> improvements in cancer medicine, just broadly speaking, are quite significant. So we've had prevention, the Cancer Council has been a really important part of that, screening and diagnosis. I mean, those MRI scans are unbelievable. I still remember in 1985 as a junior resident, when someone put up a CT scan and said, this is an abdominal CT scan. We went, oh, wow, you can see the liver. So yeah, the technology is incredible and the surgical techniques are incredible and the radiation techniques are incredible. And there's lots of other treatments. And I've, down the bottom, you probably can't see, uh, it's a very holistic approach. I get really annoyed by people who say, oh, you know, you don't practice holistically. Oh, come on. You know, we try and provide every service we possibly can from start to finish. And I think there really is a, a holistic approach. What's happened over the last 15 years? Well, Hui Gan keeps telling me every time I see him, the seminal event in 1998 was someone important came back to um, Royal Melbourne. Oh, I was me, okay. <laughs> I, I came back <clears throat> at a time where I think there were probably only two cancer doctors or two doctors looking after brain cancer in Victoria, Lawrence and Ronnie. And I came back, I was the first medical oncologist to do brain cancer. Uh, I trained in New York, mainly in prostate cancer. How many patients do you reckon I looked after with brain cancer in New York? I came back, I said, oh, I'm a brain cancer expert. <laughs> I fooled Andrew Kay at the Royal Melbourne, but no one else was doing it. And pretty quickly, brain cancer medicine became important medicine. And, and with all due respect to Lawrence and to Ronnie, who are very good, <clears throat> medical oncology, cancer medicine, which is what I am and we are, different sort of mentality. We think in a different way. And in fact, in Australia at least, medical oncology has taken over in brain cancer. 
Lots of young medical oncologists saw an opportunity. Uh, I'm clever enough to know I need help. And so the two people at Royal Melbourne I've got into brain cancer, well, one was top of Melbourne University Medicine, Catherine Field, and the other was Jim Whittle, doing a PhD now, but he was top of WA. I've got two really, really clever people coming into the field. Lots of mentoring. You know, Hui and I could be competitors if we really wanted to be. Actually, no, we're not. Uh, there can be a challenge sometimes. I want my trial to be more successful. I want my centre to be more successful. I want to be more successful. But actually, the network of the subspecialties has been fantastic for neuro-oncology. I think we all, it's a small group, and we all work really well together. Multidisciplinary teams have occurred at virtually every uh, neurosurgical site. Um, so we discuss your cases. We've got fantastic radiologists, pathologists, a couple of surgeons, a couple of radiation oncologists, a couple of medical oncologists. I bet Royal Melbourne is the only multidisciplinary neuro-oncology meeting that has a vet attending. But we have a vet. I don't know why, but he's a neurology neuroscientist, neurosurgeon at the vet school. He comes along. Sometimes he puts his cases up. So things have changed. Clinics, multidisciplinary. So not, OK, I see you, and then, oh, gee, I wonder whether the surgeon should see you. OK, well, he's back in two weeks, and you, know, you come to another clinic in two weeks' time. No, no, it's all there. And so what happens at Royal Melbourne, we've got Marcia looking after everything. So I said, Marcia, can you fix this up? I've got Kate Drummond next door. I think, I wonder whether this guy needs an operation. Kate, can you come in here? And my fa I do, I don't know, 40 things in a week, 40 sort of positions, jobs, committees, whatever. My favourite part of the week, and this is genuine, is Monday morning neuro-oncology clinic. And people look at me and go, well, come on, that must be the worst cancer clinic in the hospital, and cancer clinic must be one of the worst types of clinics. No. For us, it's a place of laughter and uh, happiness and uh, graciousness and courage and bravery. We provide an incredibly good service, and I'm, I'm sure the other multidisciplinary groups do as well. I love my clinic in the morning. I know I can help patients. I can't cure patients necessarily. I can make them better. I can make sure they're looked after. And for us, the beauty, doesn't matter whether you're James Packer or the um, ice addict from Errol Street, North Melbourne. You walk in that front door to the Royal Melbourne Medical Oncology or Neuro-Oncology Clinic, you get the same treatment. And you've got a you know, bloody good surgeon, pretty good cancer doctor, a couple of really clever cancer doctors, radiation, psychiatry, social work. We've got everything. It's the same. That's changed dramatically, and it's a really positive element. The Cancer Council's been very important in terms of uh, where are things up to? We do management surveys, so I won't bore you too much, but we looked at, I looked at in 1998-2000, and then we looked at in 2006-2008, have we got better at what we do? And the things that I think are worthwhile saying are patients got onto the radiation chemotherapy protocol that we now call the Stoop protocol very quickly. It happened very quickly, so 2005 was when it was released. Survival's gone up. Referrals to a medical oncologist, not necessarily that you got it, went up dramatically. Referrals for rehab. <clears throat> the institution of multidisciplinary uh, teams and clinics. Patients were getting seen for more treatment. And it's not that they get chemotherapi, it's that they saw someone like me or Hui or Lawrence, someone who actually knows how to look after a medical oncology patient, a brain cancer patient. Down the bottom, uh, it's hard to see, but what I really like, I'm all about equity. I don't care whether you don't speak English, I don't care where you come from, I don't care what your economics are, whether you're the ice addict from Errol Street or James Packer. Actually, what we really learnt was, doesn't matter whether you're in private or public, doesn't matter whether you're metro or regional, and it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is, you get really good treatment. You get the best treatment on this earth. I say it all the time to my patients. Now, you might argue, it's not good enough, fine. But I say to my patients, this is what you'd get in New York, London, Timbuktu. And Victorians and Australians should be proud of the fact that they are getting the best treatment. It's not good enough, I get that, but it is the best treatment. 
So there are obviously three specialties who really have to work together, the neurosurgeon, uh, the um, radiation oncologist, <laughs> and what constitutes a medical oncologist? Well, you know, the characteristics of a medical oncologist, so we're talking for you myself, got to have the brains of Einstein, the looks of George Clooney, that, that was Quay a couple of years ago, and the heart of, and the heart of Farlap. Just moving on a little bit. So we understand cancer so well now. The science behind cancer, and brain cancer for that matter, is so well understood. So this was 1980, when I was sort of doing my PhD. 1990, which I'm about to do my PhD. This was as complicated as it got. This was bowel cancer. This was like, wow. You know, one, two, three, four. Four genetic changes. Wow. How good is this guy to come up with that? Well, that's what it looks like now. Actually, that's a trick, because that's the Tokyo subway hat. <laughs> but that, that is what it looks like. But what, it, you know, what you have to feel confident in is that there is this incredible body of work going on to try and understand what makes a brain cancer cell. And why does it grow? And why is it resistant? And why doesn't that work or this work? So here's one pathway, one of those Tokyo subway maps. Someone discovered that that was important, BRAF. Uh, actually, um, Australia was very uh, important in the discovery. But if you've got that and melanoma and you work out something like that and you get a tablet like that, you get a PET scan that goes like that. So I'm old enough to remember when melanoma was untreatable. Uh, I was in the Sydney Melanoma Clinic. We called it the mole hole. And I cannot tell you what a miserable, depressing place it was. There was no treatment, zero treatment. Kidney cancer, five years ago, no treatment. Now there are treatments. Now, not necessarily curing patients, but having a really Im big impact on survival and quality of life. This personalised medicine stuff, yeah, you know, it's three fundamental elements. It's trying to work out who needs treatment. So, you know, if you've had your breast lump removed and nowadays we often give chemotherapy or hormones or some sort of treatment after that's been removed, but do you really need it? Are there cancer cells floating around? So who needs treatment? Who might benefit from treatment? And who'll tolerate treatment? So there's sort of at least three elements of this personalised medicine now. And we've got to work out how to define that. And we are, so there'll be a Venn diagram which hopefully is a bit bigger than that, but, you know, I can... I'll see a patient and I'll know the genetics and I'll know this and I'll know that and I'll say, you, you will benefit. Because one of the questions we're asked all the time is, so, you know, what's my survival? Yeah, what's the average? And I try desperately not to talk about numbers. I say, you know, there's that end of the spectrum. So anyone in my, who knows me has heard this. That end of the spectrum, people do really badly. <coughs> they cark it before the operation. And that end of the spectrum, where I fall off my chair when I see them, because I can't believe they're still here. And everything in between. You know, time will tell. So I try and avoid talking about numbers. OK, I'm going to quickly talk about clinical trial medicine, really, as an introduction for FWE. It's good medicine. There's attention to detail. You don't get the Mark Rosen thought. You know, my wife says, near enough's good enough when she gets me to do something. Always critical. I do the washing or the dish, you know, whatever. Near enough's good enough, Mark, yeah. No, that's what you get when you see. But attention to details are important. Product, protocols are followed. Patients are seen more frequently, so they feel like there's a bit more attention in TLC. That can be a disadvantage, perhaps, but they feel comfortable with that. You get great care. Our research team uh, are really good. It provides opportunity. Now, you don't have to take that. But at least I can say to my patients and Pui at the Austin can say, you know what? We've got trials here. You don't have to fly to New York and spend half a million dollars. We've got trials here. You don't have to go on it, but you know that it's here. You know that you're getting the best possible treatment on this earth, and you know when the time comes, there will be treatment options available, perhaps. That means you, you can feel secure that you've left no stone unturned. And maybe there's even improved clinical income. Our, our incomes, that's interesting. Outcomes. <laughs> there's no income from clinical trials. There are lots of caveats with clinical trials. Actually, unfortunately, very few drugs are winners. 
Now we're talking maybe 10% of drugs that get into the clinical trial program actually get to market and are of benefit. And no one can predict the winner. So when someone comes in and says, you know what, there's an um, immunotherapy trial in Reykjavik, I go, oh, where did you get that from? Well, I'll show you where they get it from. And I say, well, why would you leave home? We've got opportunities here. And how on earth are you going to fund it? Half a million dollars. And I'll, I'll tell you a paradox here. You actually don't want to go on a trial because that means something's not going very well. So I actually have a conversation. You know, here I am, I'm going to be the uh, Parkville Cancer Clinical Trials Unit Director, like the biggest clinical trials unit in Australia in about 48 days. I'll be the director. So, you know, no one believes in trials more than me, but you do not want to go on a trial because that means things aren't going so well. If, you, if they're going badly, then trials are great or if there's a new treatment that's being added to a standard treatment. But what it means usually when you go on a trial is that the standard treatments are not working. That's not good. And standard treatment means best proven treatment. Uh, just as a sort of visual, potential new medicines for one. It, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new medicines getting tested and they get down to one. And it, it's about two billion dollars of big pharma uh, monies to get a drug right through. Have we had any winners in neuro-oncology? Uh, no, not many. Temozolomide came into Australia in 1998, actually almost the same time as I did, came back. That, that's made a huge difference. That's not, not a magic medicine. It's not going to cure people. But it's made a big difference in terms of survival and care and quality of life. Maybe Avastin, it's not quite as good as the Americans would say. And just look at the numbers of drugs that are being tested in brain cancer. Lots, but very few are going to be winners. And if you ask me out of you know, the 200 or 300 drugs, which one do I think is going to be a winner? No idea. Our strengths are, in neuro-oncology, trials are a really important part of what we learn as medical oncologists. Cardiologists don't, surgeons tend not to, you know, radiologists tend not to, but it's part of our being as a medical oncologist, we do trials. And we've got large portfolios, experienced investigators. And in neuro-oncology, actually, I think it works really well. So you should feel comforted that there is a, all right, small numbers, but they're actually concentrated. So I think there's only five neurosurgical departments in Melbourne. You don't get neurosurgery at Sunshine Hospital or at Northern. You have to come into the Royal Melbourne. You don't get it in Ballarat. So we know all the patients. We've got engaged neurosurgeons and players and a really good network. Great collaborations. And as I said, you know, we and I could challenge each other if we really wanted to. Uh, we're competing for grants, we're competing for fame, we're competing for this, we don't. So that the smallish group of brain cancer medical oncologists work really well. I'm a big believer in patients being close to home, having their treatment for a matter of convenience. All right, so you've got to come into Royal Melbourne to have your surgery, but for heaven's sake, go back to Epping and have your radiation and chemo at Northern, or go back to Ballarat or Albury or whatever, and I try not to drag patients back. And here's an interesting thing, regional centres of regional doctors and patients know how to use a phone or an email. So I make it clear that this is very simple cancer medicine in some respects, but if there's a problem or difficulty or they want us, straight back. Now, we don't have waiting lists in our clinics, uh, patients come straight back. We've got the Cooperative Trials Group, which is a national group that's very active, Cancer Trials Australia, we're mentoring the next generation. I think for uh, both Royal Melbourne and the Austin and other centres, <clears throat> there are lots of um, trials. I think probably you know, you'd be surprised of the status at some of these hospitals, uh, publishing and presenting at, at a very high level. It waxes and wanes a little. So there's a problem with clinical trials. Sometimes we all have three or four studies open, I'll have none. Sometimes neither of us will have an active study. It waxes and wanes and timing can be everything. So there's a lot, I'm just going to flash those up, you know, oh, I'll go back one. So 
For uh, glioblastoma, there's been lots of trials over time for recurrent glioblastoma, lots of trials. There are trials coming. We'll talk a little bit about it. Where do you find out about Well, ask me or ask we or ask the oncologist looking after you. That's the best thing because what they should do is ring me or email me and say, look, I've got this patient who's got this, this, this and this. Is it worth sending them down from Ballarat or not? I'll say no. Yes, I'm not sure. Come and see me. There are a couple of really good avenues for you to go to and so the Cancer Council of Victoria has got this link here, uh, which is, there's an app for that, that's very useful. And if you really wanted to look at the worldwide you know, access to trials, you can go to the Cancer Institute. So presumably you'll have access to that. And it's a trials link and the national, so you know, I try and avoid patients. You know, they come in and they say, yeah, there's a great trial in uh, Boston. Oh, really? How did you choose that out of the 300 that are going on? Because I can't tell. So don't think that there is something better elsewhere. Even if there is something better out there, I don't know which one it is. It's likely to cost lots. You know, most hospitals can provide some opportunity. And probably if there's not an opportunity at Royal Melbourne or the Austin or somewhere else, there's probably not really an opportunity elsewhere. There aren't that many brain cancer trials around the world that are active and really going that I would be saying, gee, if I had $5 million, I'd go out and get it. You want to be close to home, surely. It's got to be the right trial for the right patient and the right patient for the right trial. So I'll, I'll finish off. I, I think the care of brain cancer patients has improved immeasurably. When I came back, 99 out, so we're talking 20 years. Uh, almost no doctors involved, no medical oncologists, no care coordinators, no multidisciplinary clinics, no this, no that, no... It's changed immeasurably. The outcomes for brain cancer patients has improved. You said improved significantly, improved. So I'm not pretending for a moment that, you know, we've got to the top, we're trying really, really hard. But the general care of, uh, of our patients has improved. And the scientific understanding of brain cancer has improved uh, immeasurably. Clinical trial medicine is good medicine. So when you want to talk about a clinical trial, yeah, come and talk to us. Or get your doctor to come and talk to us. And think about a trial. And if there's a trial that's suitable, terrific. If there's not, we'll just look you in the eye and say there's no trial. Uh, experimental therapies always sound better, but they might not be. So if we and I, you know, we get excited. We've got patients at Royal Melbourne and at the Austin, first time in human. So I've had patients on trials, first patient in the world ever to get a drug. How exciting is that? I love that the patients do it. You know, how brave is that? What a, what a fantastic moment that is. And when they actually get the drug, I always go up and shake their hand and say, thanks. But I know, and Paulie knows, that you know, more often than not, it doesn't work. But trials offer patients hope, and it offers opportunity. Uh, it offers great care, and I think it's worth considering. So I'll stop and probably let Hui get on and then answer any questions later. Yep. Thank you.